It's a privilege, as always, to welcome you to the webcast of Dunstable Baptist Church. This morning we're going to be reading uh, selected verses from Mark chapter 14, and we're going to be thinking together about the relationship between divine sovereignty and human sinfulness. We're going to begin by reading the text, and then we will sing, and then we will listen to the message from God's Word. Let's read from Mark chapter 14. We will begin with verse 1, and as I said a moment ago, we will only read selected verses within the chapter, and I'll prompt you each time we move from one section to the next. So let's begin with Mark chapter 14, beginning with verse 1. It was now two days before the Passover and the feast of unleavened bread. And the chief priest and the scribes were seeking how to arrest him by stealth and kill him. For they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar from the people. Now we look to verse 10 and 11. Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went to the chief priest in order to betray him to them. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money, and he sought an opportunity to betray him. Now we're going to continue our reading with verse 17, and this time we'll read verse 17 through to verse 21. And when it was evening, he came with the twelve. And as they were reclining at table and eating, Jesus said, Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be sorrowful and to say to him, one after another, Is it I? He said to them, It is one of the twelve, one who is dipping bread into the dish with me. For the Son of Man goes as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. And now we'll look to verse 26, and we will continue reading through to verse 42. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And Jesus said to them, You will all fall away, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, Even though all fall away, I will not. And Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this very night before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he said emphatically, If I must die with you, I will not deny you. Now we will uh, continue uh, our reading with verse 43. And immediately while he was speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a crowd with swords and clubs, from the chief priest and the scribes and the elders. Now the betrayer had given them a sign saying, the one I will kiss is the man. 
seize him and lead him away under guard. And when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi, and he kissed him. And they laid hands on him and seized him. But one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. And Jesus said to him, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day I was with you in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me there. But let the scripture be fulfilled. And they all left him and fled. And just now, we'll read the last section of verses, beginning with verse 66. And as Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came, and seeing Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, You also were with the Nazarene, Jesus. But he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you mean. And he went out into the gateway, and the rooster crowed. And the servant girl saw him, and began again to say to the bystanders, This man is one of them. But again he denied it. And after a little while, the bystanders again said to Peter, Certainly you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. But he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know this man of whom you speak. And immediately the rooster crowed a second time. And Peter remembered how Jesus had said to him, Before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and wept. Let's sing together just now. Speak, O Lord, as we come to you to receive the food from your holy word. Let's sing together.
Yes, Lord, this is our prayer that you would speak to us just now by the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. I want us to think for our few minutes together this morning about the relationship between divine sovereignty and human responsibility, especially as it regards human sinfulness. Now in the passage set before us today, we have numerous sinful actions, but two of them, namely uh, the betrayal of Jesus for uh, 30 pieces of silver by Judas, and the denial of Jesus three times by Peter are particularly noteworthy because they were committed by those who had been numbered among his closest followers. Now, when we think about sin in general, and when we think in regard to sins like those of Judas and Peter in particular, we might want to consider together why Judas betrayed the Lord. We might want to consider together why Peter denied the Savior. What was at the root of their sinful actions? What was, if you will, the cause of their sinful deeds. Well, if we look at it from a human standpoint, we can certainly speculate. Uh, some might say that, that Judas was motivated by hope of financial gain. The chief priest, uh, after all, did promise him money in exchange for Christ. Uh, other uh, gospel writers actually record that he was given 30 pieces of silver for this act of betrayal. Perhaps he was motivated by hope for financial gain. Uh, perhaps Peter's denial of Jesus was motivated by fear. Here he is, uh, a northerner in the south, a Galilean in Judea. Uh, here he is, uh, a rough-mannered uh, fisherman uh, here uh, speaking uh, with the cultured inhabitants of Jerusalem who were a part of both uh, the, the religious as well as the political hierarchy of the city. And perhaps he was uh, fearful. Uh, perhaps uh, he was uh, motivated by fear. The reality is, though, from a human standpoint, we are not told precisely why Judas uh, betrayed the Lord or why Peter denied the Savior. However, when we look at their sinful actions from the divine standpoint, from God's perspective, it becomes increasingly clear why they did what they did. 
Let me show you uh, from uh, this passage two reasons, and then let me show you a third from a related passage. Why did Judas betray the Savior? Why did uh, Peter deny Christ three times? Well, the first answer would uh, very simply be this. In order that the predictions of Christ might be fulfilled. In order that the predictions of Christ might be fulfilled. Let me show you, first of all, what we see uh, concerning the predictions of Christ uh, as they pertain uh, to the betrayal at the hands of Judas. Look again in Mark chapter 14, uh, beginning with verse 17. And as they were reclining at table and eating, Jesus said, Truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. And they began to be sorrowful and to say to him one after another, Is it I? And he said to them, It is one of the twelve, one who is dipping bread into the dish with me. And so we could say concerning the sin of Judas that this sin was in order that the prediction of Jesus Christ might be fulfilled. Here we are at the Passover table. Here they are reclining and eating. And Jesus says, one of you, he's surrounded by his 12 uh, most intimate followers, also called disciples that would be sent out as apostles. And he says, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. And this brought great sorrow to them. And they began to say to him, one after another, is it I? But he simply said to them, it is one of the twelve, one who is dipping bread into the dish with me. Well, when we see Judas in verse 43 coming into Gethsemane, we see that he is identified as one of the twelve. And he comes with a crowd, and this crowd is bearing swords and clubs. They're coming from the chief priest, from the scribes, and from the elders. And the betrayer, that is Judas, had given them a sign saying, uh, The one I will kiss is the man. Seize him, lead him away under guard. And it says, And when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi, and he kissed him. And they laid hands on him and seized him. Why did Judas betray Jesus? Well, in the first instance, in order that the predictions of Jesus might be fulfilled. But what about Peter? If you will look again in verses 26 to 31 you will read these words. And when they had sung a hymn, uh, they went out to the Mount of Olives, and Jesus uh, said to them, You will all fall away, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. And Peter said to him, Even though they all fall away, I will not. And Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this very night before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he said emphatically, If I must die with you, I will not deny you. 
And they all said the same. Why is it that Peter uh, denied the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, again, it is in the first instance in order that he might fulfill the predictions of Jesus. Jesus says that even though uh, I am come as a shepherd, uh, I will be struck and the sheep uh, will be scattered. He was saying that all of his followers would uh, deny him and would uh, go away from him. And, and Peter objects to this. Uh, and he says, even though all of the rest uh, fall away, I will not. But Jesus says, truly, I tell you, this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And so Jesus has given a very clear a prediction concerning the denial of Peter. If you look at verse 66, uh, under the heading, Peter denies Jesus. And as Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came and seeing Peter warming himself, uh, she looked at him and said, uh, you also were with the Nazarene, Jesus. But he denied it saying, I neither know nor understand what you mean. And he went out into the gateway and the rooster crowed. And the servant girl saw him and began again to say to the bystanders, this man is one of them. But again, he denied it. And after a little while, the bystanders again said to Peter, Certainly you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. But he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know this man of whom you speak. And immediately the rooster crowed a second time, and Peter remembered how Jesus had said to him, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and wept. Quite apart from the responsibility of Judas in his own sin. Quite apart from the culpability of Peter in his own transgression. Is the fact that from the divine perspective, Judas betrayed the Lord, and Peter denied the Lord in order that they might fulfill the predictions of Christ. But there's a second reason. It is not only that they might fulfill the predictions of Christ, but it is in order that they might fulfill the prophecies of Scripture in order that they might fulfill the prophecies of Scripture. Now, of course, Christ in his function as prophet was prophesying, was uh, speaking predictively concerning uh, events. Uh, but here, when we think about the fulfillment of prophecy, we are thinking especially uh, in regard to Old Testament prophecy, a prophecy which had been written down uh, hundreds of years beforehand. So, for instance, if you look at the uh, particular sin of Judas, you will notice that we see in verse 21, for the Son of Man goes as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. Do you notice here that he is saying that the betrayal of Jesus was in line with Old Testament prophecy, that the betrayal of Jesus by Judas was actually a fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. It says that the Son of Man goes as it is written of him. All things concerning Christ were fulfilled in his betrayal, in his arrest, in his trial, and ultimately in his crucifixion and in his death. 
But woe is pronounced upon the man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. Though his actions are a fulfillment of the predictions of Christ, and though his deeds are a fulfillment of the prophecies of Scripture, yet he is responsible and culpable for them. Woe to that man, uh, the Scriptures say, by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. And then in regard to the denial of Peter, uh, you'll note again in verse 27, and Jesus said to them, you will all fall away for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. And so whether it is the uh, betrayal uh, at the hands of Judas Iscariot or uh, the denial at the hands of Simon Peter, uh, both of these sins were committed not only in order that the predictions of Christ might be fulfilled, but also in order that the prophecies of Scripture might be fulfilled. And that's why we see these particularly important words in verse 48 and 49. And Jesus said to them, have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day, I was with you in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me. But let the scriptures be fulfilled. And they all left him and fled. And so we see both in the uh, betrayal of Jesus and the denial of Jesus, not only a fulfillment of the predictions of Christ, but also a fulfillment of the prophecies of Scripture. But the third, and perhaps, if I dare say, the most important of the three, is the fact that the sin of Judas and Peter actually fulfilled the purpose of God. It's an amazing thing how that which is intended for evil, that which is actually judged as evil, and that which causes the doer of it to be condemned as evil, that which is intended for evil, God can actually intend and use for good. And this was certainly the case with both the sin of Judas as well as the sin of Peter. That which was intended for evil and that which actually would cause them to be considered evil doers was actually intended by God for good. Let me quote none other than Peter himself, who had come to a very clear understanding of these truths, so much so that he would actually articulate them when he would stand and preach on the day of Pentecost. I'm reading from Acts chapter 2, beginning with verse 22 and continuing to verse 23. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs, that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. What is happening here? Peter is saying that the 
betrayal of Jesus, the arrest of Jesus, the denial of Jesus, the trial of Jesus, the crucifixion of Jesus, the the death of Jesus, that all of this is according to what he calls the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. And the particular term that he uses here for foreknowledge is not simply to see or to know beforehand, but it is actually the word which means to ordain or to decree before the fact. You see, the betrayal of Jesus at the hands of Judas Iscariot was ordained by God. You see that the uh, denial of our Savior uh, by Peter was ordained by God. It's an amazing thing, almost too difficult to take in, how God, without being the author of or the approver of sin, can nonetheless make use of sinful deeds to accomplish his holy and righteous purposes. Now, please do not think then, well, that means then that man is not responsible for what he does or that man is not culpable for wrongdoing or for sin. He says quite the opposite. He said, though he was delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, he was crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. And so those who um, betrayed him, those who denied him, those who tried him unjustly, uh, those who would ultimately crucify him and kill him, they were a means through which the purpose of God was accomplished, but yet at the same time, they were not guiltless. They are held responsible and culpable for their sin. Uh, we see this expressed uh, yet again in Acts chapter 4. In Acts chapter 4, we see Peter uh, and John uh, before uh, the council. Uh, we see uh, that Peter uh, and John uh, are, are being um, unjustly uh, treated uh, because they had been uh, teaching and proclaiming uh, in uh, Jerusalem Uh, the resurrection of Jesus from uh, the dead. Uh, They have now been uh, released. Uh, They have now returned to where the early church in Jerusalem was meeting. And we see these words in verse 23. When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priest and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, They lifted their voices toward God and they said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Why uh, did the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot in vain? Uh, The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. Listen, verse 27, for truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. Jesus was not in the hands of of Judas and Peter. He was not in the hands of Herod and Pontius Pilate. He was not in the hands of the uh, Gentiles or the peoples of Israel. But Jesus Christ is delivered up according to the predetermined, predestined plan and purpose of God. And now, Lord, verse 29, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness 
while you stretch out your hand to heal. And signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. You see, the early church in both their preaching, Acts chapter 2, as well as in their praying, Acts chapter 4, recognized that the sinful deeds of Judas and Peter and all the rest were actually not only in fulfillment of the predictions of Christ, actually not only in fulfillment of the prophecies of Scripture, but that they were indeed in fulfillment of the plans and purposes of God himself. So let me say two words of application. First of all, to those who sin, be sure of this. Though your sin may well be used to accomplish God's perfect plan and purpose for his people, you will nonetheless be held responsible for your sin and you will nonetheless be responsible for making payment for your sin and restitution for your sin for it is indeed, though used by God, against God. And so do not think that because your sin is a part of the plan and purpose of God that this is a way by which you can evade responsibility for it or say that you're not culpable for it or say that it is not right or just for you to be judged because of it. Scripture makes very clear. Though what Judas and Peter did were a fulfillment of God's purposes, they were still sins against God which must be accounted for. But I would have you to understand a second thing. I want to speak not only to those of you who sin. I want to speak to those of you who are sinned against. Joseph was sinned against in Genesis. Our Lord Jesus Christ was sinned against even here in this 14th chapter of Mark's gospel. Uh, we see even the early church, particularly there in Acts chapter 4, being sinned against, particularly Peter and John. Be sure of this one thing. Those who sin against you are responsible for their sin, and they are culpable for their sin. But they do not have the right to determine how God will use their sin in your life or in the life of his people, the church. They may have wicked, satanic, devilish intentions, but God will take their sin and use it as a part of his plan and his purpose for his people. Even what is intended against you for evil, God will use for good. For we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and who are the called according to his purpose. And so the sins of Judas and Peter fulfilled the predictions of Christ, fulfilled the prophecies of Scripture, and fulfilled the purposes of God. And when you sin, or I sin, we are not held guiltless just because God uses our sin in a profitable 
and beneficial way in the lives of others. And when we are sinned against, though the one sinning may determine what they do and how they do it, they will not determine how God uses it in your life for your good and for the good of his people. What all of us must do is very simply this, acknowledge that we have all sinned and all fall short of the glory of God. And we must all stand before the broken law of God with our hands over our mouths, acknowledging the fact that the wages and the consequences of our sin is death. But we believe the gospel, that God has demonstrated his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for us. And yes, you might say he died because he was uh, betrayed. He died because he was arrested. He died because he was tried. He died because he was denied. He died because he was crucified. But scripture tells us he died as a demonstration of God's wrath against sin and as a demonstration of God's love for sinners. And so if you believe in your heart that God has raised this Jesus from the dead, and if you confess with your mouth that this Jesus Christ is Lord, you will be saved. I pray that that will be the result of hearing this message in some person's heart and life, even today. Yes, you have sinned. Yes, your sins are worthy and deserving of condemnation and eternal judgment. But the Lord Jesus Christ has taken that punishment upon himself. And if you will repent of your sin and place faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. And you will discover, even as our last hymn reminds us, that though your sins are many, his mercy is more.
Well, let's come together to God in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for speaking to us through your word. We thank you for helping us to understand a bit more about the relationship uh, between divine sovereignty and human sinfulness. And we pray that these truths will remain in our hearts and minds and that you will help us as we think on these things and as we reflect on these things in the days to come. We look forward to our times of Bible study and prayer via Zoom on Tuesday, and we look forward, God willing, to our times of congregational worship in person this coming Sunday. And we pray that you would prepare us in every way for those times of gathering together in your name to worship you, the great God of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We bless your name, and we pray these things in his name and for his sake. Amen.